Welcome. Welcome to the 2023 Citizens Climate Lobby Inclusion Conference. My name is Mark Reynolds and I'm Citizens Climate Lobby's Executive Director. Uh, we exist to create the political will for a livable world. We do that through 389 chapters in the US and 80 other countries around the world. Uh, I want to say for those of you who are celebrating Rosh Hashanah today, first of all, Lashana Tova, and my sincere apologies for making it very inconvenient for you to participate today. So if you're listening to the recording, I'm very happy that you could be included in that way. I especially want to thank our conference organizers, and in particular, Karina Ramirez, Minerva, Minerva Jean, Colin Citrum, and Rachel Porter. Uh, if anybody else who's involved, thank you so much. You know, eight years ago, I read a study that listed the five most stressful jobs in the America. And at that point, we were still in, Af in Afghanistan and Iraq, and those were one and two. Three and four were police and firework, and fifth was event planning. Now, if you've never done event planning, you might think, well, it's just simple. You know, you schedule some peakers and you arrange a few things, but it's not quite like that. So yes, there are a lot of details to manage, but if you actually put on a big event like this, you're constantly managing these comparing things in your head. One is this dread that everything's not going to work out. And the other is trying to provide this huge opportunity for people to do something really big inside of. So thank you for those of you who put yourself on the line like that to make sure the rest of us could just have a great conference. In just a moment, I'll be turning things over to Karina Ramirez. She joined CCL as a volunteer in 2017 and has served as diversity and inclusion director since 2018. In her role, she supports volunteers and staff working toward inclusion and belonging efforts. She leads the diversity, equity, and inclusion monitor team at CCL, a staff level group that provides feedback and trying, tracks the organization's diversity, equity, and inclusion plan. She has supported the creation of several affinity teams at CCL, including Latinos, people of the global majority, climate and culture, Asian Pacific, LGBTQIA, plus and allies outreach, listening to indigenous voices and the differently abled action teams. Karina also supervises CCL Spanish language efforts through our website, climavivable.org and its social media accounts. Prior to her work with CCL, Karina spent a decade as a multimedia journalist for diverse audiences in Dallas, Texas. Her news stories ranged from local news to business and immigration topics, Karina holds a master's degree in journalism from the University of North Texas and a bachelor's degree in international studies from American University. When she's not working, <laughs> she's volunteering at her local community garden and participates in local climate and community events. Karina is originally from Ecuador and lives in West Palm Beach, Florida. Karina, I am really humbled to be part of this conference and thank you so much for the privilege of being able to kick it off. So let me turn it over to my colleague and friend, Karina Ramirez. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm like, I'm sitting here. I'm like, the conference hasn't started. And you're going to make me cry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's get started. Saludos. Hello to everyone joining us today. And welcome to the second annual Citizen Climate Inclusion Conference. As Mark mentioned, I'm Karina Ramirez. I am TCL Diversity and Inclusion Director. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I'm originally from the traditional lands of the Manteño Huelca in Guayaquil, Ecuador. And I'm connecting to you today from the traditional lands of the Seminole Taino Tequesta, Diaga, Mississippi, Mosogo people in West Palm Beach, Florida. Our gathering today centers around building community beyond borders and invites you to learn about different places around the world and how each community faces the challenges of climate change. As we said in our invitation to this event, our world is changing in dramatic and consequential ways and the climate emergency requires everyone participation to ensure the creation of a collective future that benefits all. This conference has been made possible by Black, Indigenous, and People of Color volunteers, each representing their respective action teams at CCL and sharing their gifts with the entire CCL community, our speakers, and members of different environmental organizations from across the country. I want to thank the members of the staff, as well as the members of the Asian Pacific, Climate and Culture, the Differently Abled, Climate and Environmental Justice, Higher Education, Latinos, LGBTQIA plus and allies outreach, listening to indigenous voices, returning Peace Corps volunteers for environmental action, people of the global majority, and the youth action team for their continued collaboration, support, and many hours of work to make this event possible during the last year. 
Our event is taking place during the second day of Hispanic Heritage Month. This is the month of celebration for everyone who self-identifies with the Latino and Caribbean cultures in the United States. I also want to acknowledge our Jewish sisters and brothers who could not be with us this weekend as they are observing Rosh Hashanah with their families. With care and mindfulness, please look at the chat and acknowledge our community agreements so that we can spend a day respecting our differences and embracing understanding. Let us take a moment of silence in honor of communities impacted by climate disasters around the world. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sarah Iyasu, the Mountain West Climate Advocacy Fellow and a member of the Higher Education Action Team who will introduce our speaker. And I wish everyone a great conference. Hello everyone, so blessed and happy to be here with you all today. As Karina said, my name is Sarah Iyasu, but more importantly, I'm so happy to present Kathy Jetno Kitchener. Kathy Jetno Kitchener, um, as a poet and artist, has received international acclaim through her performance at the United Nations Climate Summit in 2014. She presently serves as climate envoy for the Republic of the Marshall Islands and is pursuing her PhD in Pacific Studies at Australia National University. So it is with my pleasure to present Kathy to you all. Please be aware that if you have any questions to use the Q&A function, but otherwise, Kathy, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, first off, I just wanna thank the organizers for inviting me on here to share some of my work. Um, some of my poetry uh, to open this important event. I'm really appreciative of the time. I'm calling you all from um, New York, from uh, Lenape land, um, but usually I am based in the Marshall Islands. I just came out here for a training and am passing through. Um, so without further ado, um, the title of my presentation is Anpilin Koba Koman Leomero. Uh, many drops together make up the ocean. So, Dain Kate Chedangar Kitchener, Nachon Lerigan Aur, Jaloid, Namruk, Ligiab, Ebon, Iling Level Up, Joing and Alver Rumai, Yum Yumunano and Kobado Vilo, Yeni Namine, Kuala Chirian Cherabalagan, Kienang and Mayal, and Bacherabalgail. Thank you all for providing me this space today. I was just sharing the islands that I'm from and the family clan that I come from. Um, so Anpilin Koba Koman Lomedo means many drops together make up the ocean. This is a Marshallese proverb that I like to use as a guidance for the work that I do. Um, and it also allows me to uh, reflect on kind of the idea of collective responsibility. And it's also about the ways in which I bring together so many kind of different realms, poetry, um, uh, negotiations in international realm and also grassroots organizing as all a part of my work on climate action and the ways in which climate change impacts our my country, the Marshall Islands. Uh, so without further ado, I'll start with the poem. So the first poem I'm going to do is actually the first poem I've ever written on climate change. It's called Tell Them. So I haven't done this poem in a while, so um, hopefully it turns out okay. <laughs> uh, I prepared the package for my friends in the States. First, the dangling earrings woven into half moons, black pearls glinting like a storm in, a, in an eye of tight spirals. The basket, sturdy, also woven, brown cowrie shell shiny, intricate mandala shaped by calloused fingers. Inside the basket, I write a message. Wear these earrings to parties, to classes and meetings, to the corner store, the grocery store, and while riding the bus. Store jewelry, incense, copper coins, and curling letters like this one in this basket. And when others ask you where you got this, you tell them they're from the Marshall Islands. Show them where it is on a map. Tell them we are a proud people toasted dark brown as the carved ribs of a tree stump. Tell them we are descendants of the finest navigators in the world. Tell them our islands were dropped from a basket carried by a giant. Tell them we are the hollow hulls of canoes as fast as the wind slicing through the Pacific Sea. We are wood shavings and drying pandanus leaves and sickly buiros at gamims. Tell them we are sweet harmonies of mothers, aunties, sisters, songs late into night. Tell them we are whispered prayers. 
the breath of God. A crown of fuchsia flowers encircling Auntie Mira's white sea foam hair. Tell them we are styrofoam cups of Kool-Aid red, waiting patiently for the Ilomiji. We are papaya golden sunsets bleeding into a glittering open sea. We are skies uncluttered, majestic and sweeping in their landscape. We are the ocean, terrifying and regal in its power. Tell them we're dusty rubber slippers stolen from concrete doorsteps. We're the ripped seams and the broken door handles of taxis. We're the sweaty hand shaking another sweaty hand in heat. Tell them we are days and nights hotter than anything you can imagine. Tell them we are little girls with braids, cartwheeling beneath the rain. We are shards of broken beer bottles burrowed beneath fine white sand. We are children flinging like rubber bands across a road clogged with chugging cars. Tell them we only have one road. And after all this, tell them about the water, how we have seen it rising, flooding across our cemeteries, gushing over our sea walls and crashing against our homes. Tell them what it's like to see the entire ocean level with the land. Tell them we are afraid. Tell them we don't know of the science, but we see what's in our own backyard. Tell them some of us believe that God made us a promise. Tell them some of us are a little bit more skeptical. But most importantly, you tell them that we don't want to leave, that we've never wanted to leave, and that we are nothing without our islands. So thank you. That's the first poem that I'm going to perform. Um, I'm gonna give you guys a lot more context about where these poetry is coming from and the impacts of climate change following these performances. Uh, the second poem I wanted to share, oh, and this is a map showing the Marshall Islands and also showing especially the islands that um, I come from. This is the capital city where I currently live in Medjero. Um, but these are the islands um, Okay, hold on just a second. So the second poem is called Beached. And this one I have actually uh, written, uh, inspired by the work that I do attending climate negotiations and kind of the difficulties of that. Um, in the UN context, uh, you're coming into that space as a young brown woman, and then you're having to negotiate, um, you know, from a small country with limited resources, it can be a really daunting task. And so this was a reflection on, you know, my first kind of foray into that realm. And um, it was initially um, written in collaboration for a art installation that my friend was uh, putting together. She wanted to connect whales that have been impacted by military sonars with climate change. And so I had to think about it and be like, how do I connect whales to climate change through military sonars? So this was kind of that uh, effort. It's called Beached. And if the documents are true, then even the whalers avoided us. They slid past these islands, whittled without rivers from gods living in shallow trunks of knee. Whales were hunted for the simplest pleasure, a light and meat. Greenlandic hands offer me whale the same way I am offered turtle back home, in tradition, in ceremony. How conquerors stripped the sacred, left a soured carcass of commodity. Simple pleasures plundered and masticated. Destruction takes many forms. Persistent floods besiege us from all sides, even here in this meeting. We cross and crisscross an ocean of documents meant to charter an unfiltered future. Destruction takes the form of bolded words, decides, urges, requests. Three abysmal sounding lines for compassion. In August, whales die in Maui without Hawaiian hands to soothe them into soft darkness. If it was a Marshallese shoreline, the beached whales would signal a chiefly death. Harbingers of loss and damage cost analysis of disemboweled paperwork. How do we decide the proper response to a room full of sharks in suits? They can smell the imposter in our blood, the native in our speech. They offer thickets of false solutions, strategies without navigational aids. I spent the meeting searching for the simplest pleasures. You, a light to guide the thin meat of my paper heart. 
I could interpret your movements less than our enemies on all sides. Over and over, I ask you to decide your position. I urge you to reassess your motivations. I stood naked as a shoreline, requesting the simplest pleasures. So I should note for that poem that um, it also has these three lines in it. It's called Decides, Urges, Requests. This was specifically referencing the Paris Treaty where um, I was told that when a line in the Paris Treaty hat begins with decides or urges or requests that those are apparently some of the weaker um, stances, which is why I say destruction takes the form of bolded words. Um, so that's the second poem. And this is the last poem I'll read before I kind of give a bit of background on climate change in the Marshall Islands. Uh, this, the last poem I'm going to read is called Nice Voice. And once again, this is about a reflection of some of what it's like to work in um, climate diplomacy. Um, and it's also connecting um, the work in climate diplomacy, as well as um, uh, a Marshallese tradition called the KMM, which is the first birthday. Uh, Marshallese first birthdays, when, when you celebrate a child's first birthday, is a really big cultural deal. They're massive parties, and um, I think it's just become, it's continued to be a huge tradition in our culture. So it's a reflection connecting both. And so you'll see how I'm sort of reflecting on both. This is the last piece. When my daughter whines, I tell her, say what you want in a nice voice. My nice voice is reserved for meetings with a view, my palm outstretched saying here are our problems. Legacies rolling out like multicolored marbles. Don't focus so much on the doom and the gloom, they keep saying. We don't want to depress everyone. This is only our survival. We rely heavily on foreign aid, I'm instructed to say. I'm instructed to point out the need for funds to build islands, move families from Wedo to Wedo, my mouth a shovel to spade the concrete with, but I'm just pointing out neediness. So needy, these small, underdeveloped countries. I feel myself shrinking in the back of the taxi when a diplomat compliments me. How brave for admitting it so openly. The allure of global negotiations dulls like the back of a worn spoon. I lose myself easily in a KMM. KMM defined as feast, a celebration. A baby's breath endures their first year, so we pack hundreds of close bodies under tents, lined up for plates I pass to my cousin assembly line style. Gloved hands pluck out barbecue chicken, fried fish, scoop potato salad, droplets of bop and meh. Someone yells for another container of jadimi. The speaker warbles a keyboarded song. A child inevitably cries. Mine dances in the middle of the party. The MC shouts, The children are obstructing her view. Someone wheels a grandma onto the dance floor. The dances begin. Now here is a nice celebration of survival. Thank you. So that's my final poem. Um, so what I was going to do is now move into um, the Marshall Islands. So this is what Mejuro, the capital city, looks like right here. Um, so the Marshall Islands is initially basically um, a, a country in the middle of the Pacific. It's in the Northern Pacific. Uh, between the Marshall, between Hawaii and uh, Japan. So I'm going to look it up on Google Earth in a second, but basically we've been here for thousands of years as Marshallese people. Um, we've gone through eras of colonialism from Germany to Jap Japan, um, which entered us into World War II, and then we became a trust territory under the United States. Um, as a trust territory under the United States, they began to test over 60 nuclear weapons on our islands which is what this picture is. Uh, this is the Bravo bomb that was tested on our nuclear, on one of our islands on Bikini Atoll. This was 1000 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. So it's important to me that I begin by sharing this part of the history of the Marshall Islands because this nuclear legacy informs our uh, climate planning and um, actually also contributes to our vulnerability to climate change as well. Um, so four um, of our atolls are still, uh, one of our main atolls is still irradiated and we still have high rates of cancer and a lot of trauma from that nuclear legacy. And again, it's definitely informing how we interact with the climate crisis. So 
um, what are the impacts of the climate crisis? So before I get into that, I think it would help to do a little Google Earth to show people where um, the Marshall Islands is. And so this is this is what it looks like right now. So the Marshall Islands is located over here. So as you can see, this is Hawaii. That's California over there, Japan, the Philippines. And then now you just need to zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. So there's Marshall Islands right there. That's Wake Island, Guam is over here. And as you can see, that's Papua New Guinea down there and the rest of uh, South Pacific and Australia. So if you wanna see the Marshall Islands, you'd have to zoom in even further, especially to the Pacific Islands so that you can see how small and vulnerable the land space is. We occupy a lot of ocean, which is why we like to call ourselves an ocean country, a large ocean nation. Um, and a lot of us like to say we're more sea than land. So if you zoom into Marshall Islands, this is Island Level Up Atoll. It's actually, I don't wanna zoom in on Island Level Up Atoll. I wanna zoom in on Miro. Sorry, just a second. Oh, there you are. Okay, so this is Mejoro, the capital city, which has the highest population of people. And as you can see, this little line over here is the land. This is land. And so when people say, um, you know, we need to protect the coastlines, coastline city, the entire country is coastline. Someone like needed me to point that out recently, which I thought was normal, but apparently it's really not. So as you can see, there's really thin strips of land. And so this is where we're from. And that's where I live over here in Bayrut. Um, and then these are some of the more urban centers. So this is what the main urban center looks like. Okay. Um, so what does the impacts look like? So um, someone gave us some projected impacts of what sea level rise will look like. This is in uh, Teruk, which is basically the more urban center of the Marshall Islands. See, these are all houses. This is at 0.5 meters sea level rise. As you can see, the blue is um, the ocean and where it's flooded different parts of the island. And this is at one meter of sea level rise. This is at two meters of sea level rise. Now, these projected scenarios came from Chip Fletcher, Dr. Chip Fletcher, who works with uh, in Hawaii and came to the Marshall Islands and basically gave us this presentation showing us the projected um, sea level rise impacts on our islands. So this is the most urban center. So as you can see, this is a lot of flooding. Um, so, and this is the road by the airport. This is 0.5 meters of sea level rise. So already there's a lot of water there. This is at one meters of sea level rise. And then two, it's completely gone. Um, so what does it look like in real life? This is a flooding that just happened in 2019. So it was while I came back from, um, it was right when I was at a climate conference and there was this flooding that took place. And this is by the road, by the airport, what I was just showing. So um, this, what I was just told recently, was a one in 250 year event meaning that this only this kind of flooding should only happen once every 250 years, but I've already experienced it in my lifetime. And so floodings like this will start to increase as sea level continues to rise and as the heat continues to, a uh, temperature of the world continues to rise. Uh, this is also another king tide flooding, um, damaging a uh, section in RRE. It's a hotel, it's called Shoreline. Um, so that was one of the high tides. Another high tide, um, again, in the urban center. This is my cousin's house that was destroyed after one of the big king tides. I think this was back in 2012. Um, it was just one big, you know, she's been living in there her whole life. And this is definitely shared with her permission. And then this one big wave and came and knocked it out. This is an island off of Mejoro. It's called um, Elegan. Now, this island used to have trees. Uh, it used to have trees, coconut, pandanus trees, and there's a family that lived on an island next to it. And this is the landowner's husband. Um, and he was the one that told me that it used to have trees. And now, because of the constant overwash, it just looks like this. It's just, uh, it's just an, uh, sand, 
kind of like a sandbar. So this is what many of the islands could continue to look like. And this is an example of loss and damage that we're experiencing already. And so this climate crisis isn't something that's happening in the future for us, it's happening right now. So how have we in the Marshall Islands responded? Um, I think I might be running out of time. So just some quick notes on what we're doing in the Marshall Islands. First of all, we are doing our best to um, keep global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. Um, that we had a bunch of campaigns um, to get people involved and teach people that the global temperature needs to stay at 1.5 for islands and vulnerable communities to stay alive. So we look at mitigation and adaptation. Um, you know, it's important that people switch to, to renewable energy and stop investing in fossil fuel, but we also need to begin to adapt our islands to protect ourselves. So these are the countries with the most largest cumulative emissions since, uh, you know, from 1850 to 2021. As you, I just usually like to show this because it's very clear that the U.S. has actually contributed a lot to climate emissions. But if you also another thing to point out that nobody in the Pacific is on this list and the Marshall Islands is not on this list um, specifically. And, you know, that's because the Marshall Islands contributes 0.0007% of the world's total global emissions, meaning that we could become the most renewable energy island on the planet and we would still go underwater because we're not the ones causing it and contributing to it. So that's why we focus so much on international engagement. Um, we were led specifically by Tony De Bruyne, who was our former climate ambassador and minister of foreign affairs. He's known as the grandfather of the Paris Treaty. Um, and he passed away um, a while back. But you know, many of us continue in his footsteps and we continue to use the UN um, and these platforms to tell the story of what's happening to our nation. And so the international campaigning is actually a very key and crucial important part of that work. Um, also definitely trying to tell that story through journalism and through media. You know, um, all of these different articles and more have been featured to tell that story to different people about how we're experiencing the climate crisis. Um, so this is a, a story. This is a, <clears throat> a graphic that we use for the kids back in the Marshall Islands to teach them the difference between mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation turns down the heat. So you can see the fish is in the pot and he turns down the heat. And then adaptation um, protects from the impacts of the heat. So you can see that adaptation allows us to be comfortable while the heat is going, but it doesn't turn down the heat. So all this to say that um, what we try to demonstrate to people is that we need to do both. We need to not only campaign for the countries to lower their emissions, but we need to start protecting ourselves. We're here. We need to be protecting our country from the impacts of the rising sea level, which is what we're moving into now. <clears throat> um, so we're here at 1.2 degrees. We're very close to meeting 1.5 degrees. Um, oh, sorry. I also wanted to say that obviously I got into this work through poetry. So this is only a few snapshots of the different types of poetry and performances I've written on climate change. So as I've learned what climate change is and continued to learn more about it, I've written poetry highlighting what I've learned. And it, it's all on YouTube if you're interested in watching um, I would definitely recommend poems like Rise. Um, <clears throat> and that's basically how I got into the climate space, was initially just as a performance artist in those spaces before transitioning as into the role of climate envoy with negotiations um, and organizing with youth. So the national response is something we're working on called a national adaptation plan. Um, so what we're looking at is basically uh, we have gone around to a community and gotten perspectives on climate change. And so far we've visited 15 atolls to get their perspectives, 15 out of 24 uh, on climate change. And across every single island, every community is observing sea level rise. So that's not just something I'm coming here to say to you all. This is actually an observation that has come through really clearly from our community. And so we know that sea level rise is coming down the pipeline, that it's getting worse and that it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And so we're looking at really extreme solutions to protecting our islands because we're so, uh, we are so low to the land. We're only two meters above sea level. 
Um, so we're looking at extreme ones where we protect. That means we raise land, we protect using seawalls. Then we have to raise land. We have to relocate people. Um, and then we also have to consider uh, nature-based solution. So this is just sort of a graphic that shows all the different steps we have to take. And then even the timeline, a 20 year timeline, this is all suggested to us as ways of adapting and protecting our islands. Because for us, mass migration is not an option for us. We want to protect our islands so that we can stay in our home. And so some key messages from the natural adaptation plan is that climate change is our single greatest threat to the future of the RMI. Uh, in 1790 years, the sea level will rise to 20 inches, making many of our atolls uninhabitable. So 20 inches doesn't sound like a lot, but it's going to be um, the frequent flooding would actually make a lot of our islands uh, difficult to live in. We also know that protecting all of our atolls will be difficult. Uh, consultants who are giving us um, you know, feedback on our islands and who've done an assessment of how much it would cost to protect our islands from the World Bank, uh, they were contracted to do an assessment of our islands. They've told us that we have to start choosing which atolls to protect, which is completely a huge task and unfair for us to, to even consider. Um, we, it's, it's likely that there's going to need to be a relocation of our community members. There's going to be impacts on our culture and our livelihoods. And even the way we plan and vision for the future, we have to think of climate change constantly first. And then finally, we don't have the resources to overcome this challenge alone. You know, like I said, the Marshall Islands contribute to only 0.00007% of the world's global emissions. So we shouldn't have to pay for this issue. You know, this isn't aid that we're asking for. Um, it's going to require at least $9 billion just to adapt to islands out of all of the different islands. And so we know that we deserve international support. And that's a key part of our work is completing this national adaptation plan so that we can show our uh, donors and those who want to support us what kinds of changes we want to see to our own island. So it's a little bit of being able to take control of that narrative and protecting ourselves first. But the fact that we're even here, the fact that we're even having to ask this kind of question, to have the fact that we're having to plan in this way really indicates the level of crisis that we're at. You know, it's not something in the future. It's something that we're having to plan for now and that we're recognizing that it's going to get worse. Um, I think I might stop there, but I just wanted to just do a shout out to youth organizing, which is a, a huge part of the work that I do as well. I co-founded this nonprofit with uh, my cousins called Jotigum. And basically we work with Marshallese youth and have been working with Marshallese youth for over 15 years now. Um, all just trying to get Marshallese youth to be a part of the um, of the climate movement. So this is a campaign for our 1.5 to stay alive. These are all posts from Marshallese youth coming in to support 1.5 and how important that temperature goal is to countries like ours. And then these are just the different um, initiatives that we've brought young people on board onto. Um, so I'll, I can get more into that, but I wanted to give some time for questions and comments. This is also a climate and health art seminar that we do every summer. We've been doing this for five years now where we bring high school students, they learn about climate change and they turn what they learn into art through weaving, painting, songwriting, and poetry. Okay, uh, I'll stop there now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, we really appreciate um, your presentation. We only have time for one question, unfortunately, but I think it's really key that you said the Marshall Islands do deserve international support. Just want to ask one question from X in the chat. How can we best advocate for your home and our climate advocacy? Um, I do think that, you know, ensuring that holding your uh, leaders accountable to um, keep fossil fuels in the ground not opening up any more fossil fuel camp, you know, fossil fuel investments, getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies. I really think those are really big movements that um, bigger organizations like 350.org and others are pushing and leading on. And so I would say supporting those agendas is really important. Um, I think that people power really does work and organizing really does work. And so I think holding our leaders accountable is the best way to do that. We need structural change, essentially. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Kathy, for being here. Please, please, please refer to everything that's been said in the chat, but we will also be following up with you guys with all of our resources. So thank you and continue to enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.